Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, it's Jonathan Goldhill and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. Two topics that interest me as I go to publication of this podcast in December 2023 are around charity and responsibility. With charitable giving season in full swing, a key challenge for many ultra-wealthy families and family offices is navigating intergenerational discussions about holiday donations. How do you raise responsible, independent, and productive children? versus entitled trust fund babies is another topic that really interests me. My guest today is Jill Shipley, who will be discussing this and more. She is head of governance and education at Alti Tiedemann Global. Jill has dedicated over 20 years to helping families, family offices, foundations, and family enterprises navigate the unique opportunities and challenges that arise with significant financial wealth. Her experience includes past roles at Crescent Capital and the Institute for Family Culture at Abbott Downing. Jill, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Oh, great. I can't wait to discuss these topics and more. I know you're an expert and you've been in this space for a long time. And I'm so thrilled to know that you've listened to so many of my podcasts. I'm because, a fan. Yeah, because you know so many of the guests. That's amazing. That's how long you've been in the space. You have a great group of interviewees, and it's an honor to be part of your program. Great. All right. So as I usually do, let's start with you. Tell me a bit about your professional journey and your role at Alti Tiedemann Global. Sure. I appreciate it. I'll be really honest. When I was young, I saw how money could have a negative impact on families and family relationships. And I also was really confused why our education system doesn't teach us in an intentional way how to manage our money. And obviously money impacts everyone, whether you're rich or poor, and no one was talking about it. So I felt like there had to be a better way. I went to a small private university in Florida and took a course in family business and actually got to know the professor, Greg McCann, who together we built the first academic major in the country in family business. I worked for Stetson's Family Business Center and was a professor in the program, basically helping college students whose family owns a business, even if they weren't going to work in the business, to at least take a business course, learn a little bit about family systems and family dynamics to be prepared as an owner and a potential successor in the business. But academia was not for me forever. Okay. So I left Stetson and I have spent the last 20 years in multifamily offices focusing on nothing financial. So my whole job has been dedicated to helping individuals and families explore what is the impact they want their money to have on themselves, on their identity, on their relationships, their relationships with their kids and grandkids and significant other, and also on the community and world. I and think that's I great. It's yeah. a great, it's a great role. And I've been doing it for the over 20 years. And, and so I'm, explain to people for who those who might not be familiar with what is a multifamily office? What does that mean? 
Great question. Essentially, if you think about what are all of the needs that a family has that has wealth that likely will last beyond their generation, they need help managing the investments. They need professionals looking at tax implications of their decisions. They need legal folks protecting them from risk. They need folks helping them think about their philanthropic goals. And where I come into play, also their, the way that their money is invested, the way that they're structured, who they need on their team to help support them and future generations. And my role in the, the multifamily office setting is focused on helping ensure that there's cohesiveness and harmony within the family and that effective decisions can be made beyond just one core decision maker. Gotcha. And so a couple of clarifying questions. So Please. multifamily, does that mean that you are working for multiple different families unrelated to each other? It is. That possibly. Okay. It is. So um, the field of single family offices has been around for generations. Right. And you might know some of the, the names like Rockefeller. Rockefeller. And and, yes. Yep. They started okay, this Carnegie. concept. Right. The benefit of working with a multifamily office is you have the economy of scale. So mm -hmm. we have 400 families that we support and we have hundreds of professionals around the world to bring the best talent to support our clients' needs. Okay. And so distinguish that from a business manager, business management office that might reside within a large a public or private accounting firm? Sure. So we do some accounting work, but for the most part, our clients have been able to become clients because they've sold an operating business. Many still have operating businesses in place, but to have a liquidity event that gives them the capital to invest and really be the need for a out, either an outsourced multifamily office or an insourced single family office really requires the sale of at least a, one business. So we might collaborate with a business consultant like yourself. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be doing that in-house. And would you be actually paying for a business manager will take care of their car leases, uh, business, I mean, it, the nanny that they have to pay, they would do all that. Would a multifamily office take care of that instead? Or In some cases, still yeah. Great question, Jonathan. And some we would call that lifestyle services or concierge services. Okay. And in some cases, for those very large, complex, large number of family members around the world, they need a, an overseer, and so we can be the point person for that. But in many cases, there are concierge firms that that's all they do, and they might be a better resource. So we might work with the those and be the quarterback of the relationship. Gotcha. All right. So, so we aren't watering got, plants or water or walking dogs. <laughs> no, I understand that. Um, I almost once worked for a large accounting firm doing business management, and I thought it was pretty interesting. What a fun job. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it would be a really cool job. All right. So now I want to just talk about this subject that is near and dear um, because I was a recipient of a trust fund when I was 21, and it gave me um, an amazing amount of freedom. Uh, and in the absence of having a father in my life, I'm sorry about I had, that. Yeah, well, I had uh, three fathers. Um, two of them passed away when they, when I was young. Uh, my father of my father, biological father, died of a massive heart attack when I was two. Wow. And my mother remarried, and uh, unfortunately, he died a few years later of Hodgkin's disease. And then she remarried again, and by the time I was sixteen, she was divorced. And my family was. My grandfather was very successful and had less, left a trust fund. And I moved to California when I was 20 and, and started to take over um, the inheritance of that and the management of it. Wow. Big and responsibility I, at 20. Bi big responsibility. And I thought I had a lifetime amount of money and come to find out that I really didn't have that much money, but it was, it was enough so that I didn't have to work while I was 20. And so I did a lot of different things. But one of the things that was really important to me was to be responsible was to be independent and was to be productive and not to act like an entitled child. And maybe I swung too far to the ideological left where I was uh, trying to do very um, like community organizing and really responsible, charitable type work, working with a foundation. But you wrote an uh, uh, an article, let's call it an article. It's a chapter of this book, sure. which is from Wealth of Wisdom the top 50 questions wealthy families ask. And your the title of the chapter was how do you raise responsible, independent, and productive children versus entitled 
trust fund babies, which obviously is a topic near and dear to my heart. And so could you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this subject? And and then we'll get into the holiday discussion stuff. I'd love to, Jonathan. And I really appreciate you sharing your personal story. I'm sorry that you experienced so much loss as a young person and also the weight of taking on so much responsibility at such a young age. I think money is a tool and it provides a lot of opportunity, but it also can carry with it some burden, especially when we aren't prepared for the responsibility and expectation. So I can just imagine yeah. what that must have felt like. And it sounds like you really grabbed the bull by the horns and took advantage of the opportunity. And sometimes that's not the case. So maybe I could answer your question with a story. Yeah. Do you mind? Yes, please. No, love that. So this is a bit of a stereotypical story, and I'm sure it's one that you're familiar with, maybe not necessarily from your personal life, but from your professional life. So many of our clients are first-generation wealth creators. And when you look at the statistics, 80%, 80% of the wealth holders today created it themselves. And over 80% of that group say that they were raised in lower to lower middle-class upbringings. So you imagine you have nothing and you are determined to give your kids a better life. So you pound your fists on the table through blood, sweat, and tears. You build wealth. You build a business. You build success because you are determined. It might not be because of ambition necessarily or work ethic. It might be out of desperation. And then you give your kids a better life, right? Yes, And that's the dream. And the challenge then comes into play when now you're worried because your children have been raised in a better life. So they don't have the same desperation. They don't have the same ambition because there was food on the table. They didn't have to blood, sweat, tears to put the food on the table. You gave it to them. But now you start to feel frustrated that they haven't inherited your work ethic. And you start to worry, how are they going to be prepared? How are they going to understand the value of a dollar? How do we educate them? How do we make sure they're productive? Right? To your exact point into my chapter title, we don't want them to be spoiled and titled trust fund babies. Who's going to take over after me? And parents and grandparents, it's they struggle. So this, in my experience, is sort of a stereotypical story of we made it and now we Our kids aren't living up to our hopes and expectations we had of them. And in my experience, I don't know about yours, Jonathan, it makes sense. If they didn't have that desperate feeling, what would make them work 80 hours a week and live on nothing when that they didn't need that necessarily to motivate them? So my experience is how do you raise productive and happy inheritors. Mm -hmm. I think it it starts with you. It starts with a reflection of what is success, recognizing that money cannot be the determiner because it's likely when you're a client of ours, your kids are not going to make as much money as you. Right. So to have success be solely dependent on income is an unfair expectation. So my opinion is let's explore What is success to them? And for most, I don't know if this is your experience, Jonathan, but mine is when you get down to it and you ask the third question of what do you really, really want for your kids? The answer is well-being. It's flourishing. It's thriving. It's purpose. It's meaning. It's not money. And you've already given them money. So if we can stay in the heart of let's focus on purpose and meaning the majority of inheritors that I work with are responsible. They want to please, they want to do right by their parents and grandparents, and they just need a little help. So education, communication, we don't ever talk about money. It's worse than sex. We're more comfortable talking about sex with our kids than we are about money. We need to talk about it. We need to normalize it and we need to teach. What it's do you kind think? Of funny. I think it's kind of funny. I, I'm remembering growing up, uh, probably being about 18, and my mother kind of giving me the advice of, you know, sex and money, or maybe it was politics and money, but it was it was those three subjects you don't talk about. But of all, above all, 
you don't talk about money. And being the kind of uh, person that I was, uh, that was the first thing I would talk about. And so when I turned 20, I mean, I was very out about having inherited some wealth. And I joined uh, a, an organization that was literally connected to another foundation based out of New York, you probably know, called the Robin Hood Foundation. Um, in LA, there was the Liberty Hill Foundation. In San Francisco, it was the Vanguard Public Foundation. And I was involved in these organizations that were literally trying to change the dialogue and uh, by starting a dialogue around having money. Now, um, I came to realize that I was hanging around some people that were connected with names like DuPont and, uh, you know, bigger names <laughs> than I was. But still, you know, I think it was having $100,000 at my age was like life changing and mm -hmm. thought it required a huge amount of responsibility. And so the story you tell is all too close to home because uh, I, I live with someone who came from those circumstances that you described and uh, came from a foreign, her parents came from a foreign country and she was the, uh, the first born along with her younger brother on the soil here in New York um, or in the United States, I should say. And, you know, raised herself up and became very, very successful and now has those concerns about the hunger and the drive of the next generation in her family. And so... What I think is, and I, I'd like to get your input on that. Um, I'm wondering of these 80% of new immigrant entrepreneurs that create incredible success, whether or not that next generation is really even engaged in talking about charitable giving, or does that then wait till the third generation? Because there's something happening in the second generation where they're trying to maintain the wealth that was created. They're trying to create organization and and uh, they're trying to sustain it. And that, it's yes. not the conversation of charitable giving, which is so appropriate for this holiday, doesn't come up until another generation later. So yeah. what are your thoughts on this? A couple of things. And if I may, I think as a society, we would be benefited by... Caref being careful about the way we use the word success. Mm -hmm. So even to your point of those, our clients that have had success, I think not making hundreds of millions of dollars can still be a success. Right. So that's the only, uh, it's a shift, I think, in our societal. Oh, thinking. I agree. Huge. Right. We can have a lot of purpose doing nonprofit work with maybe a, a less, um, less in our bank account and more in our emotional bank account. hundred <laughs> percent. If I no. may. Um, I agree. hundred percent. I like your question. Yes. I like your question, yep. yes, like your question Jonathan. It. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, but the, the, the paradigm of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, right? Mm -hmm. There is a stereotype that okay. the second generation is maybe not as engaged and it takes some time and often some loss to mm -hmm. roll your shirt sleeves back up. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. right. I often find the the wealth creating generation can intentionally pass on the value of empathy, of community, of giving back with great opportunity comes great responsibility. That motto, that mindset can be passed on successfully to the second generation. And Jonathan, what's so cool is the younger generations of today with all the negative stereotypes that we see in the news about the millennials and Gen Z they deeply care about having a positive impact on society. They are thinking more holistically yes. about the yes. way they live their life, how they spend their dollars, how they spend their time. They care in a, in a way that is different than we have seen in previous generations. And so I'm inspired. I don't think it has to be waiting for the third generation to get engaged in giving. I think we can encourage and support families from generation one on. Okay, good. So then I you know, I want to fast forward to a question that I was thinking of posing later in the interview, which is around recommendations on how the younger generations can get involved in the family's philanthropy, perhaps advice for the rising gen on how to get a seat at the table and have their ideas and interests be considered. But before you answer that question, sure, I just want to sort of uh, like a, a small promotional thing that I do sort of is 
I have a pledge to give back. And at the end of, on December 1st of this year, between December 1st and December 15th, I am sending out emails, reminder emails to my clients saying, hey, do you remember I told you I was going to give away 5% of the coaching fees that you paid me to a charitable organization of your choosing? And I want you to think hard because I, you know, this is maybe something new for you. I don't tell them that, mm -hmm. but I want you to maybe connect it to your brand, your brand identity. You're a small, medium-sized business. You're not thinking about that you make so much money, you're going to give it away. But if you were, and you will with me, it's who would you support? Um, and I, I focused that conversation on the younger generation in the family because they're driving the future. All right. I so, love it, Jonathan, but let me you. ask you, what percentage of responses are you getting? So I get about 80% responses, but I have to nudge these people and a few, it just falls on deaf ears. And typically, I believe that the ones, who's, the ones who, I, who fall on deaf ears, they're not my ideal client. They're not someone who is thinking about giving for the good of the order, and that's kind of one of my core values. Mm -hmm. Mine is, too. Uh, so if they don't share that with me, then I'm thinking, you know, that probably wasn't a good fit as a client. They were just about taking what they could get from me. It wasn't a collaborative relationship. I, I have an, a thought that comes up for me and I'll share for what it's worth. I wonder if some of your r rising gen clients might be intimidated by the ask. I have found sometimes, especially if they didn't make the money themselves, there's almost some guilt or shame that comes with giving it away. Uh, even if it's money that they're you're they're getting to allocate based on your ask because it, they're paying you for your service and then you're donating a portion of that. And so I wonder if there's an additional conversation that might make the make you have to nudge a little less because I would right. imagine those folks want to and just feel a little intimidated by how do I do this in an impactful way that doesn't feel like I don't deserve it since I didn't earn yeah. it. How it's possible. Think? I think it's possible. I think that a lot of the people that I'm appealing to are between the ages of 30 and 50. And so they're not so young. Um, and these are ones that have contributed greatly to right. the to the um, the revenue generation of the business. If I was Gen Z, if that's the right um, mm -hmm. letter, uh, and they hadn't yet contributed, I think you are 100% spot on. Yeah, it's, and your Gen Xers and Boomers are actually. probably busy. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why you have to nudge them. Okay, let exactly. me answer your exactly. question. Okay, so great. You're, you're part of the rising gen and you want to get involved, but mm -hmm. it's almost a little uncomfortable to ask to be involved because it can feel... Um, sort of like asking how much am I going to inherit to your mm -hmm. parents or grandparents? You don't want to seem that it matters. Like you're, you're waiting for them to die to have mm -hmm. access or to have a voice or have power. Mm -hmm. And so how do we open up that conversation? And my experience is the parents and grandparents are dreaming of their children and grandchildren getting involved. So it's almost like both sides, all of the generations wish for the multi-generational engagement, but nobody wants to bring it up. The parents and grandparents don't want to feel like they're forcing their kids and grandkids and the kids and grandkids have the opposite perspective as I just described. Right. So since they want engagement, they're looking for family togetherness. They want the money to be positive. They want to make sure their legacy continues. And they have so much to teach us. One way that I think the next generation can engage in a conversation is to say, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, I have so much to learn from you and I want to do it while you're here. So can over the holidays, can we sit down? Can you tell me some stories? Can you tell me about ways that you've engaged in the community to make a difference? Can you share with me what you care about and why? Ask them to tell you stories and it open it. I, I think just to take a little tangent ramble, because of the lifespans increasing, now we have five to six generations alive at the same time sitting mm -hmm. at the dinner table for the first right. time in history. And unfortunately, we're almost making our elders invisible. 
We have this preconceived notion that we need to talk slower and treat them with kid gloves in their 80s or 90s. And some of my clients, Jonathan, are sharp as a whip right. at this generation, at this age. Engage them. And they're, my experience is they're so happy to see their children and grandchildren wanting to, wanting to give alongside of them, wanting to learn, respecting and honoring the traditions. I don't think the next generation should come in and say, let me tell you why what you're doing is wrong and how we should be doing it differently. Right. Coming in with respect and empathy and an ear to learn. And what's so cool is because of technology and the technology, technological advances, the senior generations often aren't as up to speed on what is this chat GBT or what, we, what are these? I'm hearing you can give donations over text. Tell me more. <sighs> what about social media? It seems like there's a lot of quick campaigns or GoFundMe. What is that? So I think going both ways, we can just encourage conversations. And at the holidays, what a better time Yeah, when we're yeah. together. Yeah. So are, are you a, a party or a witness to these decisions and discussions? Is there disharmony harmony is there conflict lack of conflict is there is can you get interest at all levels or, or um you know generations and get some productive conversations going what, what's your experience in this area yes so it depends my involvement depends i think if a family's just starting out you don't need a trained facilitator in the room to right. help navigate the conversation just talk Mm -hmm. I think if you have a, if you have a large, especially a private foundation or a donor advised fund where you're giving away ex significant amounts of money, you can ruin a nonprofit organization by donating too much to them because they just aren't, of course. they don't have the capacity to sustain it with that influx of cash. So right. there, and, and also it is hard. There are very different values across the generation stereotypically. And so having a trained facilitator that can help make sure all the voices in the room are heard and everyone everyone has an opportunity to speak and, and, and also that decisions are being made in, in a manner of consensus. It, you, you need sometimes the help when there are competing values and competing interests. So my recommendation to help re I like, I think every family has conflict. So we're not mm -hmm. trying to avoid conflict. We're trying to avoid relationship destroying conflict. So, right. and, and when, there's charged topics. It helps to have a facilitator. We all behave better when there's someone else in the room and someone that's managing the conversation around some ground rules. So I, but having a conversation about what we agree on rather than fighting about what we disagree on, you can give to any organization you want out of your own money. But if your family is going to engage in shared giving, focus on what you care about together, yeah. especially this time of year, Jonathan. Gosh, people are cold. People need jackets and blankets. They need food. They need gifts for their kids for the holidays. I, I don't know any family that can agree that those causes matter. So despite the fact we're in a very politi politicized climate where there are tragedies happening around the world, mm -hmm. there are polarizing political and religious things taking place. I think when it comes to shared family giving, let's focus on what we agree on. I mean, lean in. I, I agree. I mean, for me, my experience is my clients come together as a family and support an organization of their choosing that relates to their business. It's never been an issue. And if occasionally there's different ideas, they seem to just be inclusive. Like, can we do, can you do this, that, and the other thing? They'll say three, here are three organizations we want to support. Can you divvy it up? And, you know, I, I never really gave much consideration to, okay, so they've got different values, different motivations for giving. Should they be even having the conversation of, can we have more impact by just giving to one? We're not talking large enough dollars here to, to, to have those conversations, but I could imagine at a much larger family office situation where more money is at stake, having those conversations around impact is, is an important conversation to have. I think so. And Jonathan, if I could say, even at the small numbers, oftentimes the first generation puts in their estate plan that they're going to pass on a portion of their assets to charity. And often it's for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. So if that amount of money is going to grow over time, practice with small amounts and practice not 
I, it, always agreeing is just not reality. You know, we're going to come with different causes that we are care about. And when there's limited resources, we need to reach consensus. And it's a right. great way to practice around making a positive impact versus firing a key employee or selling the business. <laughs> yeah. Now, how much do you take some of these practices and institutionalize the giving and so that it becomes part of their governance documents? Um, one of the things I could imagine and have been through, I went through the Northridge earthquake and that was a dramatic impact and as uh, a guy who was running a small business and economic development center helping literally thousands of businesses in the San Fernando Valley, wow. um, these types of urgent issues or crisis situations can make you want to, uh, or, you know, humanitarian challenges, which oh, we're yeah. seeing. Drop course, everything. You know, drop, drop everything, everything and give focus. Every, yes. Right. So how much do you bake in? into their governing documents, sort of an institutionalized practice of giving a certain amount to certain types of causes? How much do you set aside for the, the rainy day, you know, natural cause, natural disaster type situation? What do you recommend here? You're speaking my language. So my so. recommendation is to have a bucket of money that is automatically given in alignment with your mission mm -hmm. and have a portion or percentage that is for the the needs of the time. It right. might be a natural disaster. It might be a global humanita humanitarian crisis. You don't know and we don't know. And mm -hmm. so giving yourself the flexibility to go off mission for your giving. But yes, governing documents. I mean, the reason we have governance in place is you want to prepare before you need it. Mm -hmm. So you want to have a, like a em family employment policy, right? You want to have a policy in place before the 18 year old slacker comes knocking at the door for the job, right? You want to have the, the eligibility requirements. It's sort of the same thing when it comes to philanthropy. Yeah. I, I believe in, in strong governance and I believe in allowing for flexibility for change. Do you have any preferred like ratios or percentages of what goes to crisis urgent stuff versus what goes to everyday no, and I'll tell you, my experience is sometimes the family just feels so driven. They might have a agreement in their governing documents that 20% is for the, the crisis moments. And mm -hmm. because of the significance to that family of the crisis, they swap and make it 80. Got it. So giving okay. flexibility for that. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. And it always goes back to the, your why. You had a really nice podcast that I enjoyed that- I don't know if the if your interview we really got to this, but I think what she was saying the whole time was focusing on why instead of the what and the how. We got to go there first. Yeah, it's always a topic of conversation in my client meetings. I really love is, it. You know, why do you do what you do? Um, what's let's talk about also the percentage of your wealth that you would give away, and I, I'm assuming this is a Christian belief or philosophy because the word tithing in my mind comes from uh, either Catholicism or Christianity, which is that you'd give away 10% of your earnings to, or maybe it's 10% of your uh, wealth. No, it's 10% of your earnings, I think. But so what rules of thumb or what experience do you see? And, uh, and I guess maybe also what percentage of your clients are involved in philanthropic. I mean, guess like, maybe a hundred percent. So I would, yes. two questions. I'd two questions. Together. The first one is most. Um, so the second question I'll answer first, which is well, how many of our clients are engaged in some form of philanthropy? Yeah. And I would say the majority it's, yeah. it comes in different forms. Some are checkbook philanthropists that, uh, you know, someone comes knocking on the door or a friend or a associate asks for a donation. That's one level. And then right. we get to a level of more structured charitable vehicle giving using donor advised funds or family foundations, which might last in perpetuity for that are sustainable across generations. Mm -hmm. And they require more governance as you move up that spectrum in terms of the complexity of the giving. Of so the, ve the vehicle defines the amount of governance that's needed, but the majority of clients are engaged in some form of philanthropy. And to be honest, it, depending on what happens with the estate tax, it, it, right now, the estate tax is your your exemption is high. So, if if you have more wealth that is over the gift ex exemption, you're right. going to give forty percent to the IRS. And many of our clients would rather donate or put that in, tr in trust for future generations. 
And so sometimes the tax tail is wagging the dog, but I don't care if it is making a positive impact on society, I'm for it. And let's just do it in a way that feels purposeful and meaningful to that family and is aligned with their values. But going to your first question. Wait, can you just clarify though? Are you yeah. saying that if they're over their lifetime gift tax exemption, which is what, 25 million thereabouts for a couple? For a couple. Okay. Or 11, 11, 12, some, 12 now um, for an individual. The purpose of giving would be because they're going to giving 40% of the money anyway to the government. So why not just reduce to come under the cap? Is that? Yeah. For some of our clients, they just are giving all their money away anyway. Some of our okay. clients say, we don't want to pass on any money to anybody else. We just want to, the world needs it and we want to give it away. Hard stop. Those are the no Warren tax, Buffett's of the world. No Oops. tax. Con right. and, and Warren's giving some of his money to his kids. Let's be honest. Right. Okay. Because so, uh, years ago it was, he's only giving them a million dollars each. And then I kind, of, I kind of figured, I thought, yeah, but he probably gave them jobs in their in the foundation. And that makes them a few hundred thousand dollars, which, and you know, I mean, as my friend used to say, how many steaks and how many houses can you live? How many steaks can you eat a day? And how many houses can you live in? So and some people want to give all the money to their family. And right. some people want to give it all to the community. To right. the to the climate crisis. And I am agnostic. I want to help you achieve your goals. And I want you to get really clear on what your goals are. So okay. there's not, in my opinion, a rule around how much to give, how okay. much is too much right. to give to philanthropy or to your kids. It's okay. it's all dependent on what you want the money to do. Okay. But the answer to your first question, I think, is a shift, which is a trend that I'm seeing. And I wonder if you're seeing in the world of philanthropy that impact as a term is broader than impact investing and that philanthropy is fitting under the umbrella of impact investing. So in previous generations, you used to earn as much as you can in your business. Right. So you could give it away in your philanthropy. Now there's an opportunity to invest with impact. Right. So you can exponentially improve the impact that you're having on the causes that you care about. And what was happening is the often the damage you were doing in the investments you were making to try to earn the greatest return were counter to your values. Now you can invest yes. with impact, often making more than you could with traditional investing. Got it. And so the money is invested and earning and having a positive impact and you can give it away with philanthropy being one of the categories of impact investing where you just have no expectation of financial return. Right. And so it's such a beautiful, it's such a shift in a mindset, in my experience on what change do we want to see in the world and what are the levers we can pull to accomplish that change? And it's not just philanthropy. So let's just uh, clarify. So when we're talking about impact investing, I think of two things. One is ESG, environment, social, and governance. Yeah. So in investing in companies that are doing good. So you might stay away from, for instance, nuclear energy or oil drilling companies and invest in solar or invest in something. I can't think of another example. So that's one case. And the, the other would be uh, companies that have a what we used to call a double or maybe now call the triple, triple bottom, bottom line. line. Sure. Right. So yeah. explain explain what that is. Sure. So I'm not an in impact investor. I'm part of our impact group. But the reason I joined Alti is because the firm is committed to having a net positive impact. And mm -hmm. that is done through the variety of different impact investment solutions. But it's not just, you know, we do have a problem in our society today around greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And I think ESG in investing, all, environment, social and governance are critical. How yeah. we are measuring that, I think, can get a little. Yes. Mark, like uh, it can get a little washed out. And so right. I think it's very important. And in the way that we approach impact investing, it, it goes just beyond screening. So you're not just screening yeah. out tobacco or gambling or yeah. guns, whatever your whatever you value and you want to remove from your portfolio. It's it or coal. It's not just screening. It might not even involve screening. It might be investing in private businesses that are women owned or minority owned. It might be private businesses that are focusing on how do we decarbonize. And that those investments are actually providing significant financial returns and change in the world at the same time. Yeah, amazing. Wow. Brings me back to my early days of investing when I was trying to do socially responsible investing. And these there you go. mutual funds and money market funds and instruments were being created out of San Francisco and New York and Washington, D.C., some people that I came to know and, and meet. And some of them became very viable organizations. Others disappeared uh, 
I guess, working assets. If you name, you probably remember way back. It's no longer a trend. I think it is, it's yep. not a fad. Exactly. It is, it is it working. Is, it is. And Jonathan, I know we're running out of time, but if I can just give kind of my maybe three or four just overarching quick recommendations related to this topic, do you mind? Not at all. And then I would like you to tell us a little bit about your organization before we wrap up. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. So if I were to say, what were what are the key recommendations for engaging in shared family giving? The first is decide what your motivation is. Mm-hmm. What is, same with what we were talking about before, right? What's okay. success? What matters? And for most families, it's, it's togetherness. Mm-hmm. So that helps you stay away from any of the polarizing, conflicting topics. So decide what you want, decide what you care about and what you agree on, number one. Number two, I am such a firm believer that none of us want to do anything that we're forced to do. So oftentimes families have great intentions and they invite all their family members to be involved in their shared giving. But when you feel forced, you want to not engage. So it's almost like if you're in a room with no doors, you're dying to get out. But as soon as someone opens the door and allows you to leave, oftentimes you stay. So giving people the freedom and flexibility to come and go, that the light is always on. You are welcome, but not required. That's number two. So important. That kind of ties to the third, which is inclusivity. It is really hard. I think when it comes to ownership in a family business, blood, you know, we have such a high divorce rate in our society. So it's understandable that you don't want your ex-spouse sitting at your boardroom table making decisions with your family. But when it comes to philanthropy, you don't own it. So engaging the spouses in this conversation, oftentimes they bring more to the conversation than the blood relatives do. So inclusivity in the conversation, especially if you want the next generation to be involved, both parents are going to have an influence. So inclusivity. And then the last one is the honoring our elders and honoring our younger generation's views. So respecting the legacy with flexibility for new ideas and new values, not having a such a rigid mission that's about someone else's goals. It's about everyone's goals. Jill, that was wonderful. Thanks. Wrap up and take us home. Tell us a little bit about Alti, Tiedemann Global, and uh, maybe even where people can reach you if they want more information. Thank you. Yes, altiglobal.com. And we are a global business, $60 billion assets under management. And we're really here to support net positive impact, investing clients' assets, helping them achieve their wealth goals and achieve their goals for their family and their communities. Awesome. And if people want to get a hold of you personally, want to find out more about what you do or have a question to ask you, what's the Jill. best way to reach Shipley you? at altiglobal.com. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Folks, you know the drill. If you like this show, please share it with others. Um, Give us a great podcast rating on your listening app of choice. And stay tuned for future episodes, where in a future episode, we'll be talking about divorce rates, prenups, Mm -hmm. and things that relate to family businesses to keep your money secure and in your family. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.